Good morning. The, the committee will come to order. Welcome to today's hear hearing, Venezuela's Sanctionable Activity. This is a joint hearing between the Oversight Committee's National Security, Homeland Defense and Foreign Operations Subcommittee, the Foreign Affairs Subcommittee on Western Hemisphere, and the Foreign Affairs Subcommittee on the Middle East and South Asia. We are joined today by the chairman of those subcommittees, Chairman Connie Mack of Florida and Chairman Steve Shabbat of Ohio. I would also like to welcome Ranking Member Tierney of Massachusetts, Ranking Member Ackerman of New York, Mr. Sires of New Jersey will be sitting in for the Ranking Member Engel today. I thank you all for, for being here. Today we are examining the Administration's policies to confront national security threats abroad through the use of sanctions. For the past decade, the United States has focused much of its attention on the Middle East. Since the 9-11 attacks, Americans have invested over a trillion dollars fighting the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Since 2001, 6,072 Americans have died in Operations Enduring Freedom, Iraq Free, Iraqi Freedom, and New Dawn. Another 44,266 have been injured. In Afghanistan alone, these numbers have risen dramatically since our current President took office in 2009. Wednesday evening, President Obama announced the intent to withdraw 33,000 troops from Afghanistan by the fall of 2012. This will leave approximately 67,000 troops behind, which is twice as many when the President Obama entered office. While I support a withdrawal, it must be rooted in prudence and not politics, because it is the right thing to do based on the facts and not because it is convenient. While we, are, while we combat terrorism in the Middle East, we must not neglect threats that we face in our own hemisphere. In recent years, Venezuela has grown significantly closer to regimes that are openly hostile to the United States and its interests. Venezuela has been a willing partner to countries such as Iran, Syria, North Korea, and Cuba. With the exception of North Korea, each of these countries has been designated as a state sponsor of terrorism by the United States Government. Senior officials within the Venezuelan government have also provided material support to Hezbollah, a terrorist organization. They have also maintained ties with the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, FARC, ELN, and ETA. President Hugo Chavez has accused the United States of being, quote, the first state sponsor of terrorism, end quote. President Chavez has also called sanctions against Iran illegitimate and that the Venezuelan government will, quote, back Iran under any circumstances and without conditions, end quote. There is little question that Venezuela's behavior is sanctionable. The question before us today is how is the U.S. government, how the U.S. government should respond to these activities in the future. What options are available? Should we continue to impose anemic sanctions that are merely cosmetic? Or should we impose sanctions that truly impact Venezuela's ability to threaten the United States of America? Before we begin that analysis, I want to express my deep frustration with the administration. Time and again, this administration has frustrated the work of the subcommittee by refusing to provide witnesses that has requested. Instead, it insults this body by sending only witnesses it believes are, quote, unquote, appropriate. It does not it does so without any regard to the judgment and prerogative of elected representatives. This Congress, and especially the Oversight and Government Reform Committee, has a constitutional obligation to oversee the management, efficiency, and operations of the executive branch. This duty is without question and without exception. At the same time, this administration has a responsibility to provide information the American people seek through their representatives. This critical check and balance is designed to ensure that the Federal Government does not overstep its boundaries and adheres to the will of the people. When the Executive Branch does not respond appropriately to Congressional inquiries, it breaches the duty of the American people. This is the third time that Congress has attempted to hold this hearing. On the first two occasions, the Administration either refused to provide any witnesses or claimed it had too little time to prepare. It is unacceptable that the Administration requires more than two weeks to formulate a thought about a matter it studies and briefs to executive branch leaders and policymakers on a regular basis. It is equally unacceptable that the Administration did not submit written testimony for today's hearing until late yesterday. The Administration had over three weeks to prepare testimony for this hearing and have known for this topic, about this topic for nearly three months. It is unacceptable that the Administration was so unable was unable to adhere to our simple 48-hour deadline by submitting testimony at the last possible minute. Perhaps this committee should investigate the management and efficiency of the executive branch in this regard. I look forward to hearing from our panel of witnesses about the successes and challenges they face. This sub subcommittee is ready to work with the departments in any way possible. We do appreciate you being here today, but understand the frustration of this committee in not being able to do its work because you are unable to do your work. 
uh, and giving us the, the documents that we deserve and need to have so we can do our job. I would now like to recognize the distinguished uh, ranking member of the National Security Subcommittee, the gentleman from, Mr. from Massachusetts, Mr. Tierney. Thank you very much, and, <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, and thank uh, the witnesses for being here today as well. Uh, we all are familiar with the 2010 Comprehensive Iran Sanctions Act, the uh, Accountability and Disinvestment Act of 2010, and we also understand that uh, the Secretary has made a finding that gasoline sales have been made in contravention of that law. And so the question really does come down, as the Chairman said, to you know, what are we going to do uh, and what should we do? Uh, I think that uh, we have to have a real clear understanding of the current sanctions regime, which I hope you gentlemen will be able to share with us today, a full appreciation of uh, how much we have discussed these diplomatic priorities for that region, what are our goals, how is it exactly that we think we are going to be able to accomplish them, and what will the current sanctions do to drive us toward those goals, and what would any additional sanctions do to that, uh, toward moving in that direction, and how should they be structured? And we have to understand the impact of any ramping up of sanctions before we start moving in that direction. So I think it is a good time for that conversation. I think that the, hopefully the, between the four of you, you will be able to give us all of that information in, in a form that uh, can benefit us as we move forward. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I just ask unanimous consent that my formal uh, remarks be placed on the record. Without objection. So ordered. I now recognize the Chairman of the Foreign Affairs Subcommittee on Western Hemisphere, the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Mack, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I, I want to associate myself with uh, your opening statement and also the statement of the uh, ranking member. And before I begin into my formal um, opening statement, I just want to say that uh, the frustration runs deep, and I, I know you guys know this. Uh, we, we first asked for you to come in front of the subcommittee on the Western Hemisphere, and you refused. Uh, you put up roadblock after roadblock and just flat out refusal. And I hope this serves as a warning that next time we ask you to come in front of the subcommittee, you will come, because either you are going to come there, you are going to come here, and if we have to use our subpoena power, we will do it. Uh, so let's not go through this circus another time. Okay? Today, in light of the U.S. State Department's recent actions in sanctioning PDVSA, the purpose of this hearing is to review and better understand the role of the State Department and Treasury Department in utilizing sanctions as an instrument of U.S. foreign policy. Specifically, I would like to concentrate on the sanctions available under U.S. law and discuss their potential application in cases where Venezuela individuals, businesses, and the government uh, are able to be sanctioned. Venezuela has become the Wild West under thugocrat Hugo Chavez. This is true for the following reasons. First, there is rampant drug trafficking and corruption. Second, terrorist organizations like Hezbollah and the FARC are officially linked to government officials. And third, Venezuela is supporting Iran and Iran's desire for a nuclear weapon. Under Hugo Chavez, Venezuela has become a hub in our region for money laundering and transshipment of illicit goods. In recent years, the relationship between drug trafficking and terrorist organizations has become closely intertwined. If you will notice up on the screen, we have uh, the uh, definition from the State Department of what a State sponsor of terrorism is, and I will let you read that on your own. Uh, it is widely acknowledged that terrorist groups have turn to drug trafficking as a source of revenue. And if we can put up uh, uh, the other slide. So this slide represents, uh, in 2003, uh, the uh, drug trafficking flight patterns in uh, Latin America. Uh, and then if you will go to the next slide, this is what it looks like in 2007. Uh, unfortunately, we can't show the slides from today uh, because those are still protected and classified. Uh, but the difference between 2003 and this map is in 2005, Hugo Chavez kicked out our DEA. Uh, as Chavez has provided Venezuela uh, as a safe haven for these narco-terrorists, the FARC, a drug trafficking and terrorist organization who largely operates in remote uh, sections of Colombia, has long received assistance, relief and material support from Venezuelan authorities. And I think this is pretty well documented. When, um, when Colombia took out uh, Reyes uh, and they took the computers, uh, uh, Interpol was able to review those hard drives 
and found significant cooperation with officials from Venezuela, uh, the Venezuela government, uh, and the FARC. Uh, so clearly, if we go back to the definition of state sponsor of terrorism, you can check that box off that there is a close tie and relationship between terrorist organizations and the government in Venezuela. Um, I also want to talk a little bit more about the drug uh, in the drug trafficking. Recently, uh, the arrest of uh, a drug kingpin that a drug kingpin by the United States, MacLed, was arrested. MacLed uh, was then sent to extradited to Colombia. MacLed has said over and over again, and also talked about payments to to government officials in Venezuela. Uh, so the the drug trafficking organizations know that they have a friend in Hugo Chavez. We also, as I talked about, know that there is a relationship between the FARC and Hezbollah. Uh, and the Treasury has sanctioned uh, members of the uh, Venezuela government for their relationship uh, in Venezuela. Uh, lastly, I want to talk about Venezuela and Iran. Uh, after many discussions and not until a hearing was when I was able to supply the State Department with specific evidence of the shipment of, and sale of gasoline, we finally sanctioned Venezuela. Unfortunately, those sanctions have no teeth. The things that you sanctioned, we currently aren't engaged in with Venezuela in the first place. So on one hand, I'm thankful that we actually did put sanctions on Venezuela. It's a good start. But this is a guy who supports terrorist organizations, drug kingpins, drug narco trafficking, and Iran. Hugo Chavez should be and deserves to be a, labeled a state sponsor of terror, and our government, uh, the gentlemen in front of us, uh, need to explain to us why he is not on the state sponsor of terrorism. And with that, I, I yield back. Thank you. Uh, the Chair will now recognize the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Sears. Thank you, Chairman Chaffetz. Not Chavez, Chaffetz. For holding this hearing, and thank you uh, to our witness uh, for being here today. Since we went to power in 1998, Chavez has cast his revolution as that of the poor majority against the wealthy oligarch. He continues to impose authoritarian populist political model in Venezuela, undermining democratic institutions and stifling the freedoms of the Venezuelan people. However, the President's once stellar approval ratings have stumbled, and in the most recent legislative election, his party's majority shrank below a key threshold, setting the stage for a heightened tension with a freshly emboldened opposition. The results of this election show that Venezuelan people desperately want change and that Chavez is losing his grip. As anti-Chavez sentiment continues to grow in Venezuela, Chavez has further, further intensified restriction on freedom of speech and press. The government has systematically undermined the journalists' freedom of expression, workers' freedom of association, and the ability of human rights groups to promote human rights, completely disenchanting all civic engagement within the country. Official harass officials' harassment and intimidation of the political opposition has grown, including the persecution of elected, state and local government officials, and media outlets such as Global Vision and RCTV International that have been critical of the government. Internationally, Chavez continues to cultivate relationships with countries that are state sponsors of terrorism, like Cuba, Iran, and Syria. I cannot emphasize enough how troubling the relationship between Venezuela and Iran is. With weekly flights that connect Iran and Syria with Caracas, collaboration between these two countries has hit a new height. I have often discussed before the Western Hemisphere Subcommittee my concerns about these flights, and I hope that representatives from the State Department could elaborate on this topic, as well as acknowledge the threat this poses both to the United States and the free nations. I commend the State Department for its most recent sanctions on two companies in Venezuela who have been connected to Iran, Iran's proliferation activities. Thus far, our strategy has been thoughtful and pragmatic. Hastily attacking Chavez could prove to have a detrimental effect on progress that has been already made and further emboldened his populist agenda. 
We must continue to make smart decisions in regards with, to U.S. policy towards Venezuela to further disable Chavez control and to encourage citizens to support democratic institutions and principles. Regionally, Chavez's influence seems to have peaked, but we must remain vigilant, for he is likely to support like-minded political allies and movements in neighboring countries that seek to undermine moderate governments. He continues to oppose nearly every U.S. policy initiative in the region, including the expansion of free trade, counter-drugs, and counter-terrorism cooperation and the regional security initiatives. Venezuela continues to extend a lifeline to Colombian narco-trafficking organization by providing significant support and safe haven along the border, and it remains one of the most preferred trafficking routes for the transit of cocaine out of South America. U.S. sanctions have successfully targeted and applied financial measures against narcotic traffickers and their organizations in Venezuela, helping to ensure regional security. Venezuela has proven that it cannot be trusted, and the United States should take the necessary measures to stifle its powers and ensure regional security. But we must do so, we must do so tactful, in a tactful manner, as not to further empower Chavez. The national, security, the, th the national security threat posed by Venezuelans are complex. We must implement the appropriate measures to protect the people of Venezuela and promote U.S. interests. I would like, again, thank our witnesses and look forward to their testimony. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. We will now recognize the Chairman of the Foreign Affairs Subcommittee on the Middle East and South Asia, the gentleman from Ohio, <clears throat> Mr. Shabbat. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I want to thank my uh, two fellow chairmen uh, for putting together this important hearing. I know Chairman Mack and the uh, Western Hemisphere staff have been trying to hold this hearing uh, for some time and have met with considerable resistance uh, from the administration and I commend my colleague for his uh, persistence. As Chairman of the Middle East and South Asia Subcommittee, uh, I and the other folks on the committee frequently confront the threats po posed by Iran and global terrorist uh, networks more globally, especially, of course, in the Middle East. Uh, the possibility, however, of an Iranian-Venezuelan alliance is particularly uh, concerning. When not oppressing its own people, the tyrannical regime in Tehran devotes a great deal of its energy to threatening American national security as well as the security of our allies in the region. The threat posed by, uh, posed by Iran takes on a new and more ominous uh, geostrategic significance when coupled with the potential of an Iranian base of operations in our own hemisphere. This prospect harkens back to the days of the Cold War uh, when all of a sudden we were no longer separated from our enemies by oceans but faced threats in our own backyard. Although the nature of the threat may have changed, such a situation is just as unacceptable today as it was decades ago. I hope that the witnesses today can shed light on the nature of this threat. More importantly, however, I hope they can outline a clear and cogent policy to address it. One of the most fundamental roles of government is to provide for the security of its citizens. We are having enough trouble combating Iranian meddling and dismantling terrorist safe havens on the other side of the globe. The last thing we need is for threats from bad actors even closer to the American homeland. Again, I want to thank uh, my fellow uh, chairman and also the ranking members uh, for holding this hearing today, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. We will now recognize the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Connolly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank the panelists for being here today. I listen with great interest to my friend from Florida, berate you for not being here previously. I serve on both the Oversight Government Reform Committee and the Foreign Affairs Committee, and I must say I have not particularly been struck with the reluctance of the administration to acquiesce to hearing appearance requests, but perhaps in this subcommittee there was a problem, I don't know. In any event, we are glad you are here. Um, each sovereign nation has the right to develop alliances beneficial to its national interests, but not at the expense of its neighbors. That is the point we have reached with Venezuela's relationship with Iran. As a result, the Obama administration, for example, recently sanctioned Venezuela's state-owned oil company PDVSA for its business with Iran. Several illegal activities in Latin America are connected to the government of Iran. For example, Iran-backed Hezbollah has actually undertaken illicit activities in the tri-border area, 
of Argentina, Brazil, and Paraguay. A terrorist group has profited from film piracy and drug trafficking in that area. The group is also suspected in two bombings in Buenos Aires that killed a total of 115 people, the 1992 bombing of the Israeli Embassy and the 1994 bombing of the Argentine-Israeli Mutual Association. Eight of the nine original arrest warrants issued for that bombing were for Iranian government officials. Though Iran and Venezuela have been linked since the founding of OPEC in 1960, the two countries recently strengthened that relationship. It is especially troubling because of potentially harmful activity undertaken under the guise of diplomatic relationships. One example is the absence of customs enforcement, for example, on weekly flights from Caracas to Tehran via the Venezuelan airline Conviasa. It is unclear who or what is being transported, but reports indicated that the flights do carry weapons for terrorists. These developments are troubling enough. They are further complicated by Iran's audacity in the nuclear arena, specifically its missile tests and air swall secret enrichment facilities in Qom. The nuclear issue is pressing and does not exist in a vacuum. In 2009, Venezuelan President Hugo Chavez expressed his support for Iran's nuclear energy development, and there have been mixed reports signal a possible Iranian assistance to Venezuela in its search for uranium deposits. The Iran-Venezuela relationship is even more troubling because Venezuela serves as a diplomatic conduit for Iran, playing an important part in cultivating a relationship between Iran and the Latin American countries of Bolivia, Ecuador, and Nicaragua. Venezuela's inv involvement with Iran is a cause for concern and illegal activities in both hemispheres that have been directly linked to the Iranian government. And I welcome today's hearing to explore that further and to look at U.S. diplomatic options with regard to this troubling and growing relationship. With that, I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. We will now recognize the gentlewoman from Ohio, Ms. Schmidt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this very important hearing. It is, uh, I don't think it should be any surprise to anyone that there is a special link between uh, Venezuela and Iran. And uh, perhaps it should be no surprise that Hugo Chavez is aggressively working to strengthen his country's ties with Iran. Um, if you look at just what has occurred in the last seven years, uh, I think it docu the documents, speak, the facts speak for themselves. In 2006, Venezuela integrated itself with Iran by aligning with Cuba and Syria as the only countries to vote against the UN Atomic Energy Agency agency resolution reporting Iran to the Security Council for its failures to comply with U.N. sanctions to terminate its nuclear program. In April of 2008, Iran and Venezuela signed a pact of mutual military support. In April 2009, the two countries inked an agreement that would create an, a development bank whereby each country would invest $100 million for bilateral economic development projects. In October 2010, the two countries signed 11 mutual cooperation agreements on such issues as trade, energy, shipping, finance, and public housing. According to an article published in the German, nursepa German newspaper Die Welt, in November of 2010, one of the agreements signed between I Iran and Venezuela in October of 2010 would establish a military base on Venezuelan soil to be jointly operated by both countries on which medium-range missiles would be placed. On May 13, 2011, Dewalt further reported that Chavez met with the commander of the Iranian Revolutionary Guards Air Force in February of 2011 to discuss the final details of the construction of the missile base, which now is being built only 75 miles from the Venezuelan-Colombian border. It is also believed that Iran is pursuing the exploration of uranium in Venezuela, an obvious ingredient necessary for Iran's continued development of nuclear weapons. Last year, RIA Novistoy, the Russian international news agency, reported that Russia, which signed a deal with Iran in 2007 to sell its five battalions of sophisticated air defense systems, would abrogate the agreement due to the new U.N. sanctions that now had been opposed against Iran. It is believed that Russia may now sell the air defense systems to Venezuela, how convenient, who in turn could sell them to Iran. 
Just recently, on May 24, 2011, the United States imposed sanctions on Venezuela's state-owned oil company, the PDVSA, for assisting Iran in its production of gasoline and petroleum production. Specifically, the PDVSA was sanctioned for selling 50 million worth of petroleum products to Iran between December 2010 and March 2011 in violation of the 1996 Sanctions Act. According to the State Department's website, the sanctions we have imposed on PVDS, PDVSA prohibit the company from competing for U.S. government procurement contracts, from securing finance from Export Bank of the United States, and from obtaining U.S. import licenses. Mr. Chairman, I applaud the Department of State for its decision to impose these sanctions. Unfortunately, it is not enough. We need to do more. Every Venezuelan company doing business with Iran should be investigated and determination should be made as to whether it is in violations of the 1996 Sanctions Act. In those instances where Venezuelan companies are in violation of the Act, sanctions should be imposed immediately. We need to show Chavez that we are serious and that there will be penalties to pay for assisting and accommodating the terrorist Iranian regime of Mohammed Ahmadinejad. Thank you, and I yield back my time. Thank you. We will now recognize the gentleman from American Samoa, Mr. Fowler Milbevig. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I do want to commend uh, both of you gentlemen for calling this joint uh, committee hearing this morning. I uh, have listened with interest in terms of this issue of uh, providing sanctions to those countries that violate our laws as well as uh, international laws. I think we have got to the point that we have become sanctionitis. Just about everything we do, we put sanctions, we put sanctions. And I have my own serious questions about the consistency of how we apply our foreign policies when we apply sanctions against countries. <clears throat> I am not suggesting that we don't uh, put sanctions on Venezuela, but there seems to be a whole bunch of contradictions here. Uh, we put sanctions, and yet I believe Venezuela is one of our biggest suppliers of oil coming to our country. And I am very curious from our witnesses if you can give us more information on the subsidiary of Citgo, I believe. It currently is one of the biggest distributors of oil in our country. And it seems to me that every time we put sanctions, but as long as there are holes in between allowing these countries to, do, uh, to, to obtain whatever their needs are, uh, then the sanctions become somewhat useless. But I am very, very curious and wanted to hear from our witnesses this morning in terms of how our whole fabric of, of applying sanctions have really been effective or they have just been just another sanction and another thing. Uh, a classic uh, contradiction, as you know, Mr. Chairman, as I indicated, uh, when something goes wrong, we put sanctions against Thailand, against Fiji, uh, all these, and yet at the same time we uh, waive sanctions uh, when Musharraf, uh, <laughs> by a military coup, took over uh, Pakistan for some 10 years despite the promises that he made that uh, we were supposed to have a democracy in that country. And uh, that never happened. But I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing from our witnesses in terms of where exactly Venezuela comes in as far as the whole host of sanctions that we put against this country. And uh, I, I will say that, uh, interestingly enough, uh, the close ties that Venezuela and uh, Iran has because of the nu nuclear issue, I believe that what happened in Japan recently has caused Mr. Chavez to have second thoughts about establishing a nuclear relationship with Iran. But I, I, I do look forward to hearing from our witnesses this morning, and, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Do any other members wish to make an opening statement? Uh, members may have seven days to submit opening statements for the record. We will now recognize our panel. The Honorable Dan Daniel Benjamin is the coordinator for counterterrorism at the State Department. Mr. Thomas Dallaire <coughs> is the director for terrorism, finance, and economic sanctions policy at the State Department. Mr. Kevin Whitaker is the Acting Deputy Assistant Secretary for Western Hemisphere Affairs at the State Department. And Mr. Adam Subin, I hope I said that properly, is the Director of the Office of Foreign Assets Control at the, at the Treasury Department. Pursuant to committee rules, all witnesses will be sworn in before they testify. Please rise and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let the record reflect that all witnesses answered in the affirmative. Thank you. you may be seated. In order to allow time for discussion, please limit your testimony to five minutes. Uh, your entire written statement will be made as part of the record. We will now go ahead and recognize uh, Mr. Benjamin. 
<clears throat> thank you very much, sir. Distinguished members of the committee, committees, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss Venezuela's sanctionable activities. I'm pleased to be here today with my Treasury colleague, Adam Zubin, and State Department colleagues, Tom Dallaire and Kevin Whitaker. Mr. Chairman, let me be clear from the outset. With respect to global efforts to counter terrorism, developments in Venezuela over the last decade have been deeply troubling. Instead of meeting his international obligations since coming to power in 1999, Hugo Chavez has chosen to develop close relations with Iran and Syria, both state sponsors of terrorism. Senior members of his government are directly implicated in providing support to U.S.-designated foreign terrorist organizations, particularly the FARC <coughs> and ELN. The administration has significant concerns about connections between members of the Venezuelan government uh, and uh, ETA as well. All of these issues have been reported on in the press. And as we have reported in the past, Hezbollah has a presence in Venezuela, and the Department of Treasury has done much to reveal these connections. I do, however, want to emphasize that the information available to us indicates that Hezbollah activity in Venezuela is limited to fundraising. We remain alert to indications of other activities, particularly operational activity, but to date there is no information to support any such connection. Venezuela must fulfill its obligations under UN Security Council Resolutions 1373 and 1540, which forms part of the legal basis of international counterterrorism efforts. These resolutions, adopted under Chapter 7 of the UN Charter, require all states, including Venezuela, to take a series of measures to combat terrorism and prevent weapons of mass destruction and their means of delivery from getting into the hands of terrorists. It is our view that Venezuela has not done enough in this regard. The Obama administration is pursuing a policy to press Venezuela to change its behavior. Our approach is about effectiveness. We are ratcheting up the pressure in a way that our analysis suggests will be most effective. We are increasing the costs on the Chavez government for its actions, including by publicly exposing our conclusions about that government's activities. We are carefully avoiding falling into the trap of providing Chavez with an opening to increase his demagoguery and exploit nationalist sentiment by falsely attempting to turn this into a bilateral issue with the United, St United States rather than what it is, Venezuela's failure to live up to its international obligations with respect to counterterrorism. We believe this approach, combined with regional efforts to moderate Venezuela's behavior, is slowly but surely bringing positive change. Imaginative and effective Colombian diplomacy has taken advantage of this environment. Since President Santos took office a year ago, we have seen a marginal but significant improvement by Venezuela. Venezuela has arrested and deported to Colombia seven senior members of the FARC and ELN, including members of the FARC headquarters section and the FARC's key European fundraiser. Most recently, Venezuela arrested a member of the FARC, General Command, Jose Conrado, based on a Colombian arrest warrant. The Venezuelan and Colombian Ministers of Defense have developed a, sh a channel of communication to discuss border security. Chavez has also publicly moved away from the FARC by, by calling for that organization to join a political reconciliation process and by disavowing as unauthorized any discussions between Venezuelan government officials and the FARC about establishing bases in Venezuela. Our actions have been targeted, well justified, and well understood in Venezuela. For the last five years, pursuant to Section 40A of the Arms Export and Control Act, Venezuela has been listed as a not fully cooperating with the United States uh, efforts country, anti-terrorism efforts country, because of its inadequate response to our counterterrorism efforts. The effect of this listing is a prohibition against the sale or licensing for export to Venezuela of defense articles or services. This sanction is a useful tool in itself and for signaling that we are not satisfied with Venezuela's counterterrorism cooperation, and it is used when a state may not meet the high threshold for designation as a state sponsor of terrorism. We have also employed an array of targeted sanctions against elements of Chavez's government. My colleagues from the Department of the Treasury and our Economic and Energy Affairs Bureau will explain the work we have done to target elements of the Venezuelan government via the Drug Kingpin Act, via Executive Order 13. 224 and the Comprehensive Iran Sanctions, Accountability and Divestment Act of 2010. Much more work remains to be done, and we will continue to closely monitor Venezuela's actions. As you know, Secretaries of State have used the state sponsor of terrorism actions sparingly since its creation in 1979. In fact, it has been more than 18 years since this power has been invoked. But this does not mean that we are unwilling to use this authority. 
All options are on the table, including designating Venezuela as a state sponsor if the circumstances warrant. We look forward to working with Congress and with our partners in the region to further encourage Venezuela to behave as a responsible international actor. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, it is my understanding that the, given that there are three uh, witnesses from the State Department that there was going to be just one single uh, uh, statement, or are we doing individual statements as well? Did I, did I have that right? There is just the one statement for the three? Or? No, my colleagues also have brief statements. Oh, yes. Mr. Delay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate the opportunity to appear here today with my colleagues. In the Bureau of Economic, Energy and Business Affairs at the State Department, we have responsibility for the implementation of sanctions targeting Iran's energy sector. Naturally, we also have very serious concerns about Venezuela's relationship with Iran in this area. Venezuela is Iran's closest political ally in the Western Hemisphere, as we have heard this morning. President Chavez continues to define Iran as a strategic ally. The highly publicized bond between Mr. Ahmadinejad and Chavez has led to declarations about broad economic, military and political cooperation, although the extent of actual cooperation is not clear. Under the Comprehensive Iran Sanctions and Divestment Act, or CISADA, the State Department is the agency primarily responsible for implementing the provisions which relate to the energy, shipping, transportation sectors and sensitive te telecommunications technology, nonproliferation, and human rights issues. The Department of Treasury has primary responsibility for implementing the financial sa uh, sanctions contained in CISADA. I know my colleague, Adam Zubin, will discuss Treasury's role in detail. Let me just add that we not, not only at State do we work extensively and collaboratively with Treasury, we do the same with all, many other agencies in the government. On May 24, the Secretary of State imposed sanctions on Petróleos de Venezuela, or PDVSA, along with six other companies, for their activities in support of Iran's energy sector. We sanctioned PDVSA because, on at least two occasions, the company provided cargoes of Reformate, an additive used in gasoline, to the National Iranian Oil Company. These shipments were valued at over $50 million, well above sanctionable thresholds established in ISA. Under the Iran Sanctions Act, or ISA, the Secretary has the authority to calibrate sanctions on a case-by-case -case basis, something that many of you have alluded to this morning. Sanctions can range from prohibitions on certain types of U.S. government assistance to a complete blocking of all property transactions subject to U.S. jurisdiction. In the case of PDVSA, the Secretary chose three sanctions that limit PDVSA's activities in the United States but do not impact their subsidiaries or the export of crude oil from Venezuela. It is important to note that this calibrated approach was chosen because it is our goal to persuade PDVSA to make the right choice and stop shipments of refined petroleum to Iran. If PDVSA does not stop, and we have seen no evidence of any further actions since the imposition of these sanctions, we have made it very clear in our conversations with them that we reserve the right to impose additional and more severe sanctions. In the case of PDVSA, we do not know what the ultimate result of these important actions will be. We are confident, however, that we have their attention based on comments from PDVSA and Venezuelan government officials. The Department of State has a very good record at convincing companies to stop supporting Iran's energy sector. Last fall, we secured the formal withdrawal from Iran of five large multinational energy companies, Royal Dutch Shell, Eni, Inpex, Stat Oil and Total. They have all removed themselves from projects in Iran. These firms have not since been joined by scores of other companies, both in the energy sector and in other sectors, who have simply recognized that the risks of doing business with Iran are just too high. We will continue our dialogue with Venezuela about this subject, and we will continue a very vigorous outreach process that we have engaged in to talk to the business community worldwide about the risks of doing business with Iran. I should note that also on May 24th, May 23rd, pardon, the State Department imposed sanctions pursuant to the Iran, North Korea and Syria Nonproliferation Act, or INCSNA. This was against the Venezuela military industries company, or CAVIM 
INCSNA provides for penalties on entities that engage in the transfer to or acquisition from Iran, Syria, or North Korea of equipment or technology controlled by one of the four multilateral regimes, that is, the Australian Group, the Missile Technology Control Regime, the Nuclear Suppliers Group, and the Vassanar Convention. These agreements regulate the export of advanced conventional weapons, weapons of mass destruction, and cruise and ballistic missile technologies. Let me conclude by stressing that we pay constant act attention to the activities of Venezuela with regard to Iran. We work with all the relevant agencies of the U.S. government to, to utilize the tools that the Congress has given us, and we will, I can assure you, we will react to concrete examples of sanctional behavior as we see them. So at the conclusion of statements, I would be happy to address any questions you might have. Thank you very much. Thank you. I, I, I want to go back to this point, though, for a moment here. The three representatives from the State Department issued one statement. We asked that Congress asked that you submit these statements 48 hours in advance. You couldn't do that. And now you each have three statements. We, we're going to hear from you. We want to hear from you. That's why you're here. Why can't you, why, why couldn't you submit your, open, your statements uh, in accordance with our rules? What was the, what was the hindrance? <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, I apologize for the uh, lateness of the submission. As you can see from those who are present here, this is an issue that takes very uh, intricate and complex coordination, both within the Department and uh, across agencies. Uh, there was a great deal of work that needed to be done in preparation for this hearing. We wanted to have the best information available. We will certainly do our best to make sure that we uh, meet your deadlines uh, in the future. I, I would appreciate that. It, it is unacceptable to do this. You obviously prepared some opening remarks, yet you failed to submit them to, to, this, uh, to this body, and we find that unacceptable. Mr. Whitaker, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Chairman, Ranking Members, Distinguished Members, thank you for the opportunity to appear here today. L let me make just two points. Uh, first, the Department shares your concerns about Venezuela's relations with Iran, its support for the FARC, its failure to cooperate on counterterrorism, and its demonstrable failure to meet its international counter-narcotics obligations. We have taken a, a series of steps over time uh, using tools provided by Congress to address these failures. We are constantly reviewing all the information pertaining to these matters to determine if the substantial, targeted, and iterative steps we have taken are appropriate and sufficient in light of the information available to us. Taken collectively, these steps demonstrate our commitment to act responsibly and consistently with legislation and policy to confront specific activities by Venezuela and Venezuelan persons. Second, let me draw your attention to Colombia's superb diplomacy with Venezuela. The resulting rapprochement between these two nations has resulted in useful and, in context, unusually productive and effective counterterrorism co cooperation. Bilateral cooperation on terrorism and security matters is increasing and being systematized, yielding notable results, including the deportation to Colombia of seven senior members of the FARC and the ELN. While we still have serious concerns about Venezuela's overall cooperation on counterterrorism matters, these are steps in the right direction and demonstrate that counterterrorism efforts work best when nations collaborate. What we seek from Venezuela is its collaboration in confronting narcotics trafficking and terrorism. In the absence of such cooperation and when possessing evidence that Venezuela or Venezuelan entities are not meeting their international obligations or are failing to comply with applicable U.S. laws, we have demonstrated our willingness to act. The Department has, has strongly urged Venezuela's leaders to pursue a path of cooperation and responsibility rather than further isolation and will continue to do so. We continue to monitor Venezuela, as well as other countries, for activities that indicate a pattern of support for acts of international terrorism. No option is ever off the table, and the Department will continue to assess what additional actions may be warranted in the future. I am happy to be here, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. We will now recognize Mr. Subin uh, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman Chaffetz, Chairman Mack, Chairman Shabbat, uh, Ranking Member Tierney, Congressman Sears, and distinguished members, thank you very much for the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss Venezuela's sanctionable activities. I am pleased to be testifying alongside my colleagues from the State Department. We at Treasury have been intently focused on dangerous activities stemming from Venezuela over the last few years. During this period, we have uncovered and acted against a range of illicit actors operating out of Venezuela, including terrorists, narcotics traffickers, 
and those who have facilitated Iran's pursuit of weapons of mass destruction. Our concern regarding the activities of terrorist groups in Venezuela is longstanding, particularly Venezuelan links to the Iranian-sponsored Hezbollah. As but one example, I would draw the Committee's attention to an action we took in 2008 targeting a Hezbollah facilitator and Venezuelan diplomat, Ghazi Nasraldin. Nasraldin was a Venezuelan diplomat who served as their charge d'affaires in Damascus, Syria, and he utilized his position in the Venezuelan government and as the president of a Caracas-based Islamic center to provide financial support to Hezbollah. Among his activities were providing Hezbollah donors with specific information on how to route their contributions such that they would go directly to Hezbollah. Nasr al-Din met with senior Hezbollah officials in Lebanon to discuss operational issues and facilitated the travel of Hezbollah members to and from Venezuela. At the same time as we took action against Nasr al-Din, we also exposed and sanctioned another Venezuelan-based Hezbollah supporter, Fauzi Kana'an, and two travel agencies that he operated out of Caracas. Of course, Venezuela has also been deepening its economic and diplomatic ties with Iran, as the Committee's members have noted. The growing ties between Venezuela and Iran are very worrying, especially as they stand in such stark contrast to the global trend in which the world is moving to isolate Iran because of its uh, pursuit of nuclear weapon and other destabilizing activities. In 2008, the Iranian government established the International Development Bank of Caracas, or Banco Internacional de Desarrollo, in Venezuela. Shortly after its opening, we moved to sanction this bank under our counterproliferation authorities due to the bank's relationship with the Export Development Bank of Iran. We will act firmly and quickly to deny a purchase to any attempted successor. We have also named under our sanctions authorities the Iranian oil company Petropars and targeted its operations in Venezuela in particular. Finally, we have been extremely active in the field of combating narcotics trafficking and have sanctioned thousands of entities across Latin America, including in Venezuela. Among those, we have sanctioned high-level Venezuelan officials who are involved with the FARC, including the head of Venezuela's military intelligence agency, their chief of state security, and their former interior minister. The threats posed by Iran, terrorism, and narcotics trafficking are complex, and we work closely with our interagency colleagues to bring all of our tools to bear against these threats in Venezuela as elsewhere. And our work can and must continue. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate that. We will now, uh, I am now going to recognize the uh, Chairman of the Foreign Affairs uh, Subcommittee on the Western Hemisphere, Mr. Mack from Florida, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> and I uh, want to thank all of you for your uh, testimony here today. And, and uh, I don't think we need to continue to harp on this, but you know, we, we look forward to more open dialogue and cooperation from all of you. Um, so uh, it sounds to me that we are in agreement that uh, Chavez is sponsoring terrorism, whether through narco trafficking, through uh, his cooperation with Iran, uh, through Hezbollah, support of Hezbollah. Uh, and uh, the FARC and other terrorist organizations. So it sounds to me that there is agreement. I think where the, the problem lies is uh, what do we do about it? So I first want to make this point, uh, and I will say it again. We are happy that there were sanctions placed on Chavez. Uh, what we are not happy about is that the three sanctions that were placed on Pedavesa the denial of export-import bank loans, credits, uh, denial of licenses uh, for the U.S. export of military uh, and militarily useful technology, uh, and, and prohibits uh, on U.S. government's procurement from entities. These are things that are already not happening. So we can also agree that these are toothless. Is that right? Chairman Mack, I would respectfully disagree with that final evaluation. I wouldn't say they are toothless, because what we have done is warned the international business community that there is a danger of dealing, dealing with pay to visa. Okay, just because I, because I, okay, I, so, so, okay. So the designation of being sanctioned is important, but the sa actual sanctions that took place don't have any teeth, because these are things that we are currently not doing with Venezuela. Chairman, the, um, the fact is 
Congress has given us a calibrated set of tools to use in instances like this, basically implying that we have to make a very complicated calculation as to U.S. interests in each one of these instances. Now, we had to judge whether the sanctions would induce PDVSA to stop its behavior. So far, we have I, I, under, I understand that. I am sorry. I just, but, so, the, so the fact that you made the sanctions is important here. The, what you sanctioned isn't important because these things are currently not being done with Venezuela in the first place. And so that is my take, and I think that is most everybody else's take. Uh, we have other, there are other tools that are available, uh, yes, restriction of imports, um, uh, also prohibiting the san uh, sanctioned entity from acquiring, holding and trading any U.S. based property. So there are other sanctions that we can use. But I want to get back, well, first of all, um, uh, let me ask you this. Uh, who, who owns PDVSA? It is 100 percent owned by the Venezuelan government, sir. So there is no mistake, then, that this is a, the, the actions of PDVSA uh, isn't by some company. It is by the government of Venezuela. I think we can assume there is an intimate relationship there. I would assume that Chavez is, has full control over PDVSA. But, sir, we also make a calculation as to U.S. interests. And if 10 percent of U.S. oil imports, imports are coming from Venezuela, with three U.S. refineries dependent on Citgo, 6,000 gas stations, 3,000 other employees, we have to weigh those factors as well, especially so, during so the I would suggest of spiking then, oil prices. Uh, sir, then I would suggest that the State Department sign off on the Keystone XL pipeline, uh, which will then be able to, to take over for any oil that we are getting from uh, Venezuela. Uh, it seems to me that uh, if, we're gonna, if, if you or the State Department or are going to continue to use, we have a strategic interest in their oil and we have an, uh, uh, the ability to get oil from somewhere else, we ought to get it somewhere else. Wouldn't you agree? I would say generally that is a, that's a fair point of view. So we can expect the State Department uh, to sign off on the Keystone XL pipeline? I can only promise to take your views back, sir. <laughs> I, I, think they under, I think they know my views. Um, uh, so, again, the, uh, the, the definition, countries determined by the Secretary of State to have repeatedly provided support for acts of international terrorism. That is the State Department's definition of a state sponsor of terror, correct? That is the basis for the designation, yes. But that, but that is the definition. That is what is posted on the website. That is what the State Department. So how, is, how can you not designate Chavez as a state sponsor of terror when we know the narco trafficking, the support of Hezbollah, uh, even if it is just fundraising. By the way, I, I thought that was kind of interesting that uh, I don't remember who said it, that only in fundraising. Uh, but fundraising is the mechanism that allows Hezbollah to work. Um, so we know drugs, terrorist organizations, support of Iran, uh, all three of these things would be a determined by the Secretary of State to repeatedly provide support for terrorist organizations? Well, the statute, sir, allows the Secretary discretion to decide when repeatedly is uh, sufficient enough to merit the imposition of this, uh, of this designation. And as I said in my, uh, in my oral statement, sir, our approach is very much predicated on uh, effectiveness and what it is that is going to get Venezuela to stop behavior that we believe is unacceptable. That is, why we have, uh, that is why we have instituted a calibrated, iterative process in which we are escalating pressure as appropriate without having uh, follow-on or side effects that we believe would uh, harm our own national security and harm the interests of those who we cooperate with very closely, including to contain Venezuela's behavior. Hey, thank you. I, the, the gentleman's time has expired. Given the, the number of members on this, uh, this panel, I would ask members to uh, keep within the five minutes, uh, and, but we'll, we will allow our witnesses to, to answer past that moment. We will now recognize the ranking member of the committee, uh, Mr. Tierney. Thank you. Obviously, uh, when you talk about the sanctions, you, Congress passed a bill that allowed the Secretary some discretion into how she applied those sanctions. Am I right, Ambassador? Absolutely correct. All right. So the task for the Secretary at that point in time is to calibrate, as you say, or to make a determination as to which sanctions uh, to implement at any given time and try to get the response she wants from that, while at the same time taking into other considerations of, of what might happen to impact our allies or our own interests. Is that right? Correct. So 
I don't want to get into negotiating here in public with um, Venezuela or anything of that nature. So can I ask you to give us a broad range of all of the competing interests that we have there? Uh, when the balancing is going on, uh, give us a range of what types of things we are balancing, the, the cooperation with uh, Colombia in terms of drugs and borders, you know, other things like that, and just give us some idea of all of the different interests. Okay. Well, I will uh, defer in a moment to my uh, uh, colleagues from, uh, from the Regional Bureau from uh, World, uh, Western Hemispheric Affairs. But certainly uh, the diplomacy with Colombia is very important. Colombia would be very, very uh, sharply affected by such a designation. Uh, since Colombia is at this time making significant progress in dealing with Venezuela and in curtailing uh, those uh, activities that we find objectionable, it would seem to be counterproductive uh, to do that uh, at this time. Additionally, there are such second and third order effects as catching uh, the business dealings of lots of uh, closely allied countries up in the state sponsorship net, if you will, that uh, if other countries that were doing business were with Venezuela suddenly found themselves to be uh, in, in danger of being sanctioned, that would be problematic. I believe Mr. Dallaire has spoken to the issue of our energy concerns in this regard. So there is a whole array of different, uh, of different interests that need to be taken into effect. And I think Mr. Whitaker may have more to add on that. If I could just add on with a, a couple of points here, is e U.S. policy in Venezuela is a number of folks, one, democratic development, supporting U.S. persons, U.S. national security, and then uh, counter-narcotics and counter-terrorism. All of those are very important to us. We would need to weigh, it seems to me, the effect of any sanction we take on issues like that. Uh, Ambassador Benjamin mentioned the effect that would have of a sanction against Venezuela when Venez Venezuela views Colombia as a close ally of the United States. How would Venezuela then react with respect to its diplomatic efforts in Colombia? That's, that's unknown to me, but it's out there. Venezuela consistently tries to define the democratic opposition in Venezuela as tools of the United States. Again, that might be a, an avenue or a place where the Venezuelan government would seek to identify that group and, and take some action in response to an action that, that we took. Finally, we have many U.S. companies in, in, in Venezuela, and it's, it's our goal as the Department of State to understand their interests, defend their interests, and we would need to take into account as well uh, any impact in that regard with respect to those companies that continue to do business in Venezuela. Thank you. If the Secretary has just decided to throw the book at Venezuela and just take the more extreme sanctions on that, what would the anticipated current anticipated response of the Venezuelan government be? It's, it's hard to say. I have worked on Venezuela since 2005, and he, he, Hugo Chavez can be unpredictable. But one of the threads of his uh, policy since taking office in 1999 is consistently to try to turn whatever problem or issue that arises into one of him versus the United States, whether that is accurate or not. Uh, I, I think that he would do this. He would seek to turn this into a matter of a, a U.S. attack on his government and seek to use it for internal political purposes. How that would manifest itself, whether in diplomatic policy or with respect to democratic uh, opposition in Venezuela or with respect to U.S. companies, is, is difficult to predict. So in, in striking this balance so far, and I assume that you recalibrate frequently uh, on this look at that basis, how would you uh, rate uh, the performance of this so far? Are you getting the results you want? Are you considering further sanctions? Are you thinking that things are moving along the way you want them to? Or are you, are you just thinking that we have to do something else, just not sure what yet? Uh, I would uh, say that uh, it is um, it's early to issue the report card given the recent uh, activities, the recent sanctions that have been imposed. Uh, we are, um, uh, I would say, uh, somewhat optimistic because of the uh, actions that Chavez has taken in terms of extraditing uh, FARC operatives from Venezuela to Colombia, encouraged by uh, his uh, apparent solicitousness of uh, Colombian demands, and encouraged uh, as well by the fact that there haven't been, and I'll let Mr. Dallaire clarify this if he wants, that there haven't been further shipments uh, of the kinds of uh, uh, petroleum additives, gasoline additives. Uh, uh, of the kind that were uh, recently sanctioned. So uh, at the moment, we are cautiously optimistic. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. Now I recognize uh, the gentleman uh, from Ohio, Mr. Shabbat, for five minutes. I thank the Chairman. Um, 
Just a, a couple of questions, maybe an observation first. Um, obviously, in our capacity as uh, Middle East and South Asia, that is where we devote most of our uh, energy and, and time. Uh, happened to be in the region there recently, and uh, uh, Saudi Arabia is obviously very concerned at this time about uh, Iran exploiting uh, the so-called Arab Spring or whatever terminology one prefers, and they see themselves as being encircled, uh, whether it is Yemen. Uh, Egypt is, uh, has closer relations with Iran than it did before Bahrain, and we saw the Saudi reaction uh, there. But uh, certainly Iran is flexing its muscle, and, and uh, I really do welcome my and, and uh, commend my fellow chairs for talking publicly about this Venezuelan connection with Iran, because it is of great concern. It shows that this Iranian threat is really global uh, in, in nature. Um, and uh, obviously Saudi Arabia, uh, you know, a lot of oil there, but, uh, you know, the most known resources uh, in the world at this time, Iran is second or third, depending on the study that, that you see. But the point I would like to get to at this point is that, uh, I mean, oil is a, is a commodity, obviously, on the world markets, and uh, what we pay here in the United States is affected by the, that supply. And so the, uh, you know, our, our interest here, whereas, you know, we do import Iranian oil and it affects the price here, uh, you know, depending on how much we get from there and, and elsewhere. I think many of us believe that we have made a, really a terrible mistake becoming so dependent upon foreign oil uh, in many ways, and some of that is by restricting access to our own resources, whether it is Anwar or the Outer Continental Shelf or a, a whole range of other things here. Um, but relative to, to Venezuela, would, would, and, I, and I would invite this from any general, are we putting ourselves in a much more vulnerable position? when essentially we are reliant upon this Venezuelan oil, uh, the money goes down there, and they are clearly one of the bad actors in this hemisphere right now, and what they are doing is against our best interests. So uh, this, this continuing to be so, so dependent upon foreign sources of energy, our policies in that area uh, have, have, uh, have been counterproductive here. Would you agree with that, Mr. Dallaire? I will ask you if you would like to take that? Well, I think there is little to argue about in your statement there, sir, because uh, it is a fact that uh, our sanctions policies are often directed at those countries who are oil producers, and of course we are dependent on that external source of energy. Um, I think we all wish it were true that we had many alternate sources of energy to depend on, but at this point, historical point in time, we have to move very carefully as to how how, uh, how we apply some of the tools that have been provided to us so we can maintain the flow of energy to our market while still demonstrating a strong political message that certain kinds of behaviors are unacceptable. And, and I think it is clear um, that, that, the Venez that Venezuela and Chavez in particular has been using uh, American money, essentially, uh, either to bribe or influence other nations uh, in this hemisphere and, and, and the actions uh, that, that they are encouraging them to take are oftentimes uh, diametrically opposed to what is in the United States' uh, best interests. And I think it, uh, you know, we, we basically have in Venezuela now what we had in, in Cuban uh, over the last number of decades, the difference being, of course, Cuba didn't really have a resource. They were dependent upon the Soviet Union, former Soviet Union. Venezuela has oil, and so it's a, it, it's perhaps even more dangerous uh, than than Cuba was over these these last decades. I I would at this time I don't didn't give them a lot of time there when much of a question, but I'd like to yield to the gentleman uh, for any time I have remaining. Thank you, thank you. Uh, and and to that point, uh, I believe that uh, we're we're sending basically 117 million dollars a day to Venezuela through PDVSA. So we are funding someone who we have sanctioned. We are funding these, uh, this activity that supports terrorist organizations through this funding. And once again, I will make, 
Uh, I think that we, the State Department needs to look at alternative ways, instead of continuing to buy oil from Chavez, uh, we need to find alternative ways to, to get that oil. The gentleman's time has, uh, has expired. Uh, I would like to let uh, members know we have one vote on the floor. It is the intention of the Chair to recognize Mr. Saris for five minutes for his questioning, then stand in recess until 10.30, and then we will resume uh, the, the, uh, the remainder of the hearing. So with that, we will recognize Mr. Saris for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to get back to this question of Iran and the flights into Venezuela and the embassy and, and, and the activity in Venezuela. I had dinner with a group of people, and they tell me that the amount of people in the Iranian embassy in Venezuela is one of the largest in the world. I talked to other people. They tell me that that is not true. In your best estimation, what is the embassy in Venezuela from Iran, the personnel? How many people do they have there? How active are they? How many flights a week do they have? Does it conform with the, with the I don't want to say conform, but the amount of flights that you have into Venezuela, would eight people be enough? Can, you, can anybody respond to that? I can try, Congressman. Uh, there was uh, some months ago a direct flight initiated between Tehran, Damascus and Caracas. Our information is that as of September 2010, that flight, the, the Tehran link was dropped, and it is now a Caracas, Madrid, Damascus flight and return. Uh, there are continuing rumors, as I think you mentioned in, in your opening statement, that uh, the individuals who arrive in Venezuela are not subject to customs and immigration controls. We have heard those stories, too. We don't have a way of verifying them. Uh, since 2006, we have attempted to conduct, uh, DHS has con attempted to conduct the uh, statutorily required inspections of uh, the airports in Venezuela because they are endpoints for, for flights to the United States. Um, because Venezuela refused to permit those inspections, uh, safety inspections, security inspections, uh, in September 2008, DHS issued a public notice on this point informing passengers of our inability to, to do the inspections. Um, in an example of, you know, I am not going to call it progress, but there has been a change and TSA was able to make a, a visit to Venezuela last week. They spoke to Venezuelan security officials. They, you know, this is not the end of a process, but for the first time since 2006, we actually had a meeting on this topic. Um, now, in terms of the size of the, Venez uh, the Iranian embassy in Venezuela, um, according to the dip list, there's 14 diplomats there. There are many embassies in Venezuela, including our own, that are, that are far, far larger than that. Uh, I, I was DCM in Venezuela. I didn't consider it to be a particularly active uh, embassy in terms of diplomatic activities, showing the face, public diplomacy, et cetera. What we can't judge, of course, is how active they were within the Venezuelan government. Um, but th there is additional information on this, and um, if, if appropriate. So, how many flights do you have a week now? It's a weekly flight. Just one. And it doesn't go to Tehran. So all these things, all these rumors that there were two or three flights a week, all these crates that are coming in and out, you can't confirm any of that? There previously was a weekly flight. There is no more. Currently, uh, Chavez is in Cuba. Do you have any information on that? I mean, supposedly he got an operation in Cuba. Uh, what, what we know is, is, what we can talk about here is, uh, in early May, he had what he uh, defined as a, a knee operation. Uh, in June, he came out publicly and said that he had a, a pelvic abscess drained. Uh, he has not appeared in public for some weeks now. Uh, he He's has come by with Castro, maybe. Uh, there was a picture of the two of them together. <laughs> Castro looked better than Chavez in the picture. So, um, unfortunately, the. Um, <laughs> And he has not tweeted in his Twitter account uh, for some weeks, which is, it, it, sounds, uh, it's, it sounds jocular, but, but in fact, he's a very uh, active tweeter. And it, it's interesting that he's gone offline in this way. I don't know if that's a good idea. Uh, <laughs> are we helping the opposition? I know the opposition is growing in, uh, in Venezuela. Are we assisting the democracy process in, in, uh, in Venezuela? And, Sure. Uh, th thank you for the question. Uh, since 2002, uh, the United States, through U USAID, has provided support to 
uh, encourage the development of civil society and democratic practices in Venezuela. Much of what we've done in recent years has focused on uh, get out the vote, uh, defend the vote, protect the vote, uh, and these kinds of activities to ensure that the maximum number of people can vote in, in free and fair conditions. Uh, I think it's important to note that we do this in an, in an ecumenical way. It's not designed to approach any, any particular political end, but to support democracy as democracy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen's time has expired. We have roughly eight and a half minutes uh, left in the vote. This uh, committee will stand in recess till approximately 10, let's say call it 1035 now, uh, and then will we resume the, the remainder of the hearing?